avoidance of all doubt, this hat is not tasty. Really pleased today to um, have Peter Beck on the show. He's the CEO and founder of Rocket Lab. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, my, my pleasure, Becky. Great to be here. Could you tell us a little bit about Rocket Lab? Um, what motivated you to start this company and how is it kind of distinct from other space companies out there? Rocket Lab is, is an end-to-end -end space company. Um, I think we're most famously known for, for small launch, but uh, we also build spacecraft and, uh, and satellites. Um, and, uh, and also, uh, you know, moving into uh, more of the applications side of the space industry as well. So, uh, you know, we're, we're a company with a, a very strong track record over, you know, over 19 launches uh, under our belt, over 100 satellites on orbit. That's really exciting. And, and given that you've had uh, all the success in low Earth orbit, I know that Venus in particular has been a long time uh, passion of yours and a destination that you wanted to explore. Yeah, I mean, it is a fascinating world. Uh, what first got you interested in it? And, um, you know, just tell us a little bit about your journey towards like eventually getting there. The earliest memory I have of, um, of of space really is standing outside with my father, uh, looking up at the night sky, and him explaining to me that all of those uh, those stars in the skies were, were suns, and you know a lot of them uh, have planets around them, and there could be somebody standing on that planet looking back at me, and um, you know that was probably a, quite a bit to take in for a, for a, you know I don't know how old I was, but sub five years old and uh, and and that was really the point in time what, that really you know set my trajectory um, you know forever and I look at Venus and really the to me the arguably that the largest question we have as a species you know is uh, is life unique in this universe um, I don't know of a bigger question than that and that's really the question that I'm trying to answer right back from when my father took me outside and showed me those stars. So I always promised myself if I ever had the ability to try and answer that question, that I would give that a shot, no matter how low or remote the, the, the you know the probable outcomes could be. And uh, I'm I'm in a very fortunate position now that I, I have a rocket company and an interplanetary spacecraft. So it would seem very rude to not give this a crack. Well, I mean, that's what's fascinating too, is just this idea that um, private companies could get into interplanetary exploration, this realm that very much has been public um, and governmental space organizations. So that would be, I think, a real game changer for a lot of these worlds that we want to visit, um, including Venus. And, you know, I agree that it would be completely rude of you. It would be a, such a faux pas if you if you didn't go, so. Imagine that, yeah. I know. That would be the, the ultimate failure. Yeah, ultimate <laughs> <For failure. real. laughs> Exactly. So, um, you know, this has got, become even more topical and relevant um, since last year, there was a potential detection of phosphine, possibly a biomarker, lots of debate in the scientific community about that in Venus's sky, skies. Um, but you know, it's not a new idea that Venus might have a uh, micro something like that in the sky. So um, in many ways, I feel it's been an overlooked planet compared to Mars where we have really cool missions and you know, it's, it could have uh, extinct life or something like that on it. But um, it just seems like why not go to this sister planet? And so do you, um, do you think that like Venus is more interesting than Mars or, or can you not pick favorites when it comes to that kind <laughs> the of <stuff>? planets? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I mean, look, I, I, I completely believe that, that Venus is the most underrated planet in our solar system. I mean, uh, for, for a number of reasons. Yep. I mean, uh, it, it's one of the one of the, the planets that has the potential for still existent life. So that, that kind of, you know, raises its ranking. That's a couple of stars there to, to begin with. Um, but also, if you look at Venus as an analogue to Earth, I mean, mm -hmm. Venus is just Earth gone bad. Um, so uh, there is there is tremendous amount of that we can you know that we can learn from Venus with respect to climate change, and and it's kind of you know the Earth's sister that that it's just you know just you know gone down the wrong path. So uh, let, let's make sure that we don't go down that wrong path. And, and I think there's a tremendous amount to learn from Venus, um, you know, as a planet for our, for our own planet back here on Earth. Yeah, and to that point, you know, what would this mission look like? Um, would this be a, a, a mission that you'd have a lot of time to go into the skies and get some samples, or is it kind of a, of a quick, um, 
test demonstration for stuff that you want to do later. Well, I mean, the, really the, the, the mission is to pathfind and it's also to show that this can be done. And, and I, I seriously hope that there's a whole campaign of missions that come in behind it. But, um, but, but you know, as I mentioned before, you know, even, even how remote the possibility of, of finding some kind of uh, evidence of life, it's still worth a shot. Mm -hmm. And um, this mission will be very, very remote. Uh, literally, you know, we, we've got around about 200 odd seconds in the in the in the you know the atmosphere of Venus to take samples and uh, and look for markers of phosphine and and kind of any other organic uh, compounds. So, um, you know, it's it's one instrument, um, you know, a, a laser tuned mass spectrometer, um, and and you know, it's not like we're going there with a, the whole science lab. So, you know, it, it's it's a it's a high risk mission. Um, to get a very short uh, sample of, of, of the atmosphere um, and uh, a very short amount of time and small amount of data to try and, and, and try and make some hypothesis about, um, about what we see. Um, but still a thousand percent worth it. Yeah, I mean, it, it will be a fascinating mission regardless because as you mentioned, you know, this will be the first private mission there. And, um, and it's just such a rare planet to be able to study in the first place. There's not a lot of history of exploration. Um, so that's all great, but say, okay, just speculate. Speculate that it's that tiny shot and you do get it. You get like some kind of very strong evidence that there is um, microbial life in the skies of Venus. How do you think that would change the world? I mean, even if it's just microbes that we find on another planet, what's the perspective shift knowing that we're not alone? Firstly, it would force a whole bunch of science on Venus because it was like, okay, there's something going on here. We really need to understand this. Secondly, I think, um, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty hard to argue with kind of, you know, completely undefendable truth. Um, and and I, I think that, that you know, that, that will change people's kind of view on, on the universe and, and our solar system even. You know, if there's life on Venus, is, is the life, uh, life on some of the, the, you know, the moons of Jupiter? And what is that life? Is a life in, uh, you know, our nearest Alpha Centauri, uh, star neighbors and some of the planets orbiting that. I mean, it would be amazing to see a kind of flotilla of new <laughs> missions to Venus be inspired by yours and including, you know, follow up missions that, that I'm sure you would want to do yourself um, with Rocket Lab. You know, uh, I wanted to ask a little bit just about the history of exploration of, of Venus, because although, you know, we haven't um, studied mm. it as much as, as Mars, uh, especially not in, in the US with NASA or anything, um, the Soviet missions there are really fascinating. The Amazing. Program, yeah. I Amazing mean, the, mission. So did you take inspiration from those, uh, you know, now decades old missions, but also like very sophisticated missions to Venus? Absolutely. And the Pioneer missions are, are incredible as well. I mean, you know, one of those little probes made it right to the surface of Venus and transmitted uh, for, for, you know, some time. I mean, that's incredible. Um, incredible. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, you know, the, the, the work that's been done there to date has, has just been phenomenal um, uh, and, and absolutely take inspiration um, from, from what's been done there in the past and, and, and learnings, quite frankly. Um, you know, our, our re-entry probe, probe will look very similar to the, the Pioneer missions and, and their entry probes with kind of, you know, improved materials and, and, um, and you know, improved structures and improved electronics and RF links and all those kinds of things. But fundamentally, um, it, it's, it's a kind of a very similar uh, kind of approach. Um, and, you know, I, I have to ask, too, just uh, given that interplanetary exploration has been so much of a governmental thing and seen as sort of like a public service, is there like a business case for going to other planets or does that not really matter to you? Like, is it just a matter of wanting to start a new type of exploration from the commercial space sector and, you know, profits don't matter in that uh, in that endeavor? Well, I mean, for this particular Venus mission, you know, there's a much greater cause here, right? Um, and uh, but but I do believe that if we can demonstrate this, uh, it, it fundamentally does change the way that we need to think about doing planetary science. Um, you know, if we if we can, if a private company can go to Venus and even try to look for life um, for some tens of millions of dollars, then instead of spending billions of dollars on on missions once every decade, it does open a door for a platform that can go to other planets and other destinations for some tens of millions of dollars and do really meaningful um, meaningful sciences. And it also kind of changes the risk posture as well, because you know, if, if you're gonna spend you know, a decade and billions of dollars, um, your risk posture just changes because um, you know, at some point it crosses a threshold from being, you know, it can fail to it cannot fail. Um, and when you're spending some tens of millions of dollars, you're definitely within that th threshold where you can take risk and it can fail. 
So you can put new sensors and take take you know look look for new technologies to do new things in a much more aggressive way. Um, so you know I, I think uh, I think ultimately you know we, we'd love to see um, lots of the photon probes you know proliferate through our solar system and learn as much as we can. But I guess you know the pure scientist in me really really wants some of these questions answered, and I think um, you know everyone looks to make a contribution in their lifetime um, to the species and and this is this is why I say this is rude for me to not try because this is one thing that that, that I can do that you know may or may not um, inc increment our knowledge of, of the universe and our solar system and and maybe increment increment or even answer in, like I said in, in my mind the biggest question that we have is as a species one of the reasons that I'm you know excited about your Venus mission is that I know you're a man of your word because you recently um, ate a hat <laughs> ate your hat this hat is not tasty <laughs> Yeah. Because you had made a promise and, you know, that is a, a a figurative phrase that most people take figuratively, but you or you had you had said that you weren't weren't going to go into the reusability rocket game, right? Is that correct? And right. um, I believe electron and, and neutron are both going to be at least partially reusable. Correct. I just I mean, I'm really impressed, honestly, and I have to ask, like, how did that taste? Like, <laughs> well, I mean, so, so firstly, we have a, we have we have kind of a saying at Rocket Lab, and and it's, you know, we do what we say we're going to do, and everybody here gets measured against did they do what they said they were going to do, and mm -hmm. um, you know, we have a, a huge pride in, in the culture here of execution, um, so you can't let the team down in, in that respect, and uh, there was some some advocacy for a fake hat, but. Um, Nevertheless, uh, if you're going to do what you say you're going to do, so you better chow down on some some nasty tasting hat um, at the end of the day. So, and it is nasty tasting. I don't recommend that at all. That was the worst thing I've ever put in my mouth. That's for sure. <laughs> okay, good. Well, I guess that means that uh, when you're making predictions about the future of the company, maybe you're going to pull your punches a little bit more in the future. I, I'm, I'm never saying never again. That is a fact. That, that That's why we, we, you know, we got it all out in one hit that we're building a large rocket, which we said we'd never do. We're doing, we're doing, we can, you know, it's going to be human, you know, human spaceflight capable. So we got mm -hmm. it all out. So hopefully there's no more, no more hat eating in the, in the future for me. And I've learned my lesson to not constrain my thinking, you know, so tightly.